Good morning, Church. I'm Jonathan, and this is Christine, and we're the Wong family, and uh, we're here today uh, to welcome you all and uh, to do a call to worship. Uh, so today's passage that we wanted to share with you comes from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So for us, uh, I know recently John and I have just been feeling really, really tired. Um, so we're in the process of selling our home. And we're also trying to keep our house clean all the time and preventing the kids from touching any of the staged areas of our house. And we're also com coming in and going out of our house to allow for showings. And it's just been exhausting. Um, and then to top it all off, we're still working full time while also trying to keep our ki kids alive, entertained and healthy. So to top it off, yesterday, Isaac came down with a fever and a runny nose. Um, so we're all in quarantine right now because he just got tested today. and. It has been absolutely exhausting. Um, so today I just opened up my Bible and God reminded me um, that I can find rest in him. That throughout all the craziness of life, he reminds me to just quiet my heart and to just find peace in him. Um, I'm reminded that even if our house doesn't sell, if Isaac has COVID, hopefully not, or if we all, if we fail at our jobs, we are never too far from God's loving embrace. Amen. And I hope that's a blessing for you guys and uh, see you guys at service.
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my love, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious state, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. I will offer up my life in spirit and truth, pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you. In surrender I must give my every part. Lord, receive the sacrifice of a broken heart. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? 
What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell, not even in part of the debt of love that is on by this thankful Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Joanne, and I am MCBC's children's pastor. A few months ago in children's ministry, we started a new segment of worship that we call God Stories. A God Story is a moment or moments in your life where you saw God at work. It's a part of our testimony. Oftentimes, we hear testimonies at baptisms, where the person getting baptized will share what they were like before they made the decision to follow Jesus, why they made the decision to follow Jesus, and how their life has changed since. And these are all good things to share about. And more often than not, these baptism testimonies often do include moments where we saw God at work in our lives. But God is at work each and every day of our lives. So we actually have so many God stories that we can and should be sharing about. By sharing our God stories, we get to know more about the power of God made real in each of our lives in different ways, because everyone has stories that are unique. By sharing God stories, we also get to know more about each other. Today, Reverend Ho is going to be sharing a small part of his God story with us. Dr. Edward, on behalf of the parents, I would like to thank you for taking the time to share your spiritual journey with us this morning. As a parent, my kids sometimes ask me why I ended up with my current occupation. So, uh, why do you choose to become a religious minister? Do you want to get rich? Uh, does a pastor earn a lot of money? Well, I wish you had done more research before you ask such a question. Technically speaking, no pastor chooses to enter Christian ministry because of what the career can offer. All pastors, including myself, believe that God had called us to the gospel ministry. Wow, calling! Do you mean God actually spoke to you in an audible voice? Although God can still speak to someone in whatever form He chooses, my calling was more of an internal urge to devote my life to serve God as my vocation. My call to ministry and my conversion experience actually were inseparable. When I first accepted Christ as my Savior, I already had the desire to understand the Bible and share the Gospel full time. This is cool. Now, can you tell us how you develop your faith in God after you have demonstrated such a desire? Definitely. Before someone becomes a pastor, the person needs to be trained in the areas of understanding and teaching the Bible and other church-related skills. The school that provides uh, such an education is called a seminary or Bible college. Unlike public schools, we actually need to pay tuition. I still recall that after I got accepted by the seminary of my choice, I was still short of money to pay for the first year tuition. I prayed very hard at that time and asked God to provide. I was a computer programmer back then and so sent out um, a lot of resumes to many companies randomly asking for a part-time position. As September was approaching, 
I finally received a phone call from a company. The supervisor at the other end of the phone conversation um, said he believed uh, I'm a good candidate uh, for the position uh, because of my background and asked me why I was applying uh, for a part-time position only. After a few seconds of consideration, I told him that I wanted uh, to study in a program not related to work. He continued and told me he was still interested in knowing which subject it was. At that time, I was talking to myself. If I tell him I want to study in the seminary, he would probably think that I'm only half-hearted in my work. But now I'm going to be trained to become a pastor. How can I not trust God in this? All these thoughts uh, happened in just a few seconds. So after a few seconds of that silence, I told him that I wanted to study uh, the Bible and theology. There was a few seconds of silence on his side. Then he spoke up and asked me to go to the company the next morning. And wow, I was hired and praise God. My supervisor actually was not a Christian, but he continued to give me the flexibility to work in the office when I have no class for the next two years or so. God is so good. This is amazing. Can you share more with us how you have experienced God? Please tell us more incidents how God has answered your prayers. While we can experience God through answered prayers, and the Bible does mention that our God is one who listens to prayer, answered prayer by no means is the only way we can experience God. As I continue to walk my spiritual journey, there were actually more times that my prayer was not answered, at least immediately or in the way that I would have expected it. When you search through the Bible, this phenomenon is in fact consistent with the experience of the people of God. Great, I learned something new today. I haven't finished yet. Later in my spiritual journey, I would say I experience the presence of Jesus in my life whenever I practice the biblical truth. When I was a new Christian, I focused more on knowing the biblical content. Now I pay an equal amount of attention to my character formation. In fact, uh, character formation is part of spiritual formation. Also, I would say that I experience the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in my life whenever I followed His guidance and served God faithfully. When I look back, I was actually loving myself when I served His church, even as a pastor. I was always eager to exercise my spiritual gifts and not willing to t take up other responsibilities. Now I'm learning to ask what God wants in His church and how I can participate in His plan. I would say serving at MCBC has enriched my life not only as a pastor but also as a disciple of Jesus. Thank you very much for your sharing today. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. The topic of today's sermon is faith and family. I have to admit that at times I found the sayings of Jesus quite disturbing. For example, in Luke 8, the Bible says, 
Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Well, can you imagine when your mom is looking for you when you are upstairs in your room? Your sister hears your mother and locks on your door. Mom is looking for you. What would happen if you say, My mom and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. I bet your mom will not like your response. Well, yes, you are not Jesus. Well, Jesus was using the opportunity to declare that his family in the kingdom of God went beyond earthly relationships. Remember another time in Luke 14? The Bible says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, yes, um, the language is, is quite harsh. Jesus is using hyperbole to capture the seriousness of his demand. In fact, to hate appears to be a Jewish expression to convey the sense of preference. You may compare uh, this passage with a parallel teaching in Matthew 10. In Matthew 10, the Bible says, Jesus says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Today, I want to focus on yet another passage on Luke, chapter 9. There are three potential disciples who enter into dialogue um, with Jesus. And this is the first conversation. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, this first uh, conversation has nothing to do with family, our central focus this morning. But since uh, this is in the same passage, I will briefly explain the significance of the conversation. Jesus response uh, might be discouraging, but actually he was quite honest. Following Jesus in his days means that one follows a traveling teacher who can offer no sense of physical or financial security. Unlike other uh, prestige um, rabbis or uh, teachers in his time, Jesus was not part of an established community. Well, I guess uh, none of us today would follow Jesus uh, because we want to get rich or famous. Yet, there is at least one similarity between now and then. Being a disciple of Jesus means belonging to a minority group. If you are a student and are not attending a Christian school, I bet uh, you would agree with me. Most of your students, uh, fellow uh, students and teachers do not share the same Christian faith and values as you do. But don't let this phenomenon be a reason uh, for you to walk out of your faith. In fact, this should be something that uh, you expect uh, in your spiritual journey. Jesus says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, 
but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Being a disciple of Jesus should expect to be insecure according to the values of the world. Let's move on to the second conversation, which is more relevant uh, to today's main topic. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So why was Jesus so harsh? The person's request appears to be a perfectly legitimate one, since burial of the dead touches the heart of Jewish piety. It is a duty of loving kindness that has the highest priority among all good deeds. Bearing a parent was the chief responsibility of a son and a religious duty as well. You might have heard other explanations that attempt uh, to soften the radical nature of Jesus' uh, demand. For example, some propose uh, that to bury my father is an idiom, uh, meaning let me care for my father until he dies. Well, of course, this uh, explanation can uh, soften uh, the harsh response of Jesus. But there is no biblical or extra biblical evidence to support such an interpretation. It is beyond imagination that one would say burying his father while his father is still alive. What does Jesus mean by leave the dead to bury their own dead? Again, he was using the opportunity to teach a lesson. Let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. And this is what uh, Jesus meant. Anyone outside the sphere of discipleship to Jesus is spiritually dead. He continues, But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I must emphasize that Jesus' response uh, to that person was unique to that particular individual. Just like when Jesus uh, demands the young rich man to sell all his possessions and follow him, remember that story? It does not imply that all disciples of Jesus uh, must sell all their possessions in order to follow Jesus. The Bible does describe Christians in a variety of social classes. That said, Jesus' uh, demands should not be taken as only metaphorical. He meant it, at least to that particular person. Jesus meant it. Perhaps the main point uh, why Luke uh, wants to uh, record uh, this conversation is that discipleship to Jesus uh, takes priority over family considerations. Let's continue with the third conversation. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, the request of this uh, prospective disciple echoes echoes that of um, Elisha when Elijah found him uh, plowing a field. In 1 Kings 19, you can see that actually when uh, Elijah uh, found Elisha and wants to uh, pass uh, the role of uh, being a prophet uh, to him. Uh, at that time, actually, Elijah was plowing. And Jesus uh, apparently picks up the image of plowing here and teaches that discipleship to him should look forward to the kingdom of God and requires a break of one's previous commitments, even to those at home. Well, if the person is single, those uh, would 
refer to the person's parents and perhaps extended family. If the person is married, those would include、uh, the person's spouse and kids. Yes, again, Jesus' demand is harsh. Elijah granted Elisha's request to say goodbye. Jesus apparently does not grant this person's request. As people in Jesus' day were comparing Jesus with Elijah, Jesus wanted to make clear that he was no mere Elijah. To follow Jesus requires a commitment higher than anything one could possibly imagine. So faith and Family. When the two clash, discipleship to Jesus and God's calling take precedence. Let me share with you my personal story. I had quite a bit of、uh, formal education in computer science, and have been working as a computer programmer. My parents were kind of happy、uh, with what I was doing back then,、uh, even though I was at that time living in Alberta, while they were living in Toronto. Shortly after I became a Christian, I was convicted that I was called into Christian ministry as a vocation. So after searching for suitable theological institutions, I decided to go with the one in GTA. The school was called Ontario Theological Seminary at that time, and the name later changed to Tyndale Seminary. When I told my parents that I wished to go back to Toronto to pursue my training、uh, for becoming a pastor. What do you think、uh, their response、uh, was? Do you think they would say, "Oh, yeah, congratulations! We are so proud of you"? Not a chance. My mom cried actually on the phone. Literally, she cried, and yearning me not to, not to come back to Toronto, not to go back there.、Uh, they told me I could become a pastor after they pass away. This actually was their response, and after prayer, I decided to go back to Toronto and follow God's calling. For the next few years, I tried、uh, my best to demonstrate to them that my decision might not be as horrible、uh, as they thought it would be. But this was not the end. I also recall that. There were a couple of occasions when the three of us, like, bumped into one of their friends in a、uh, dim sum restaurant or some other places. And when their friends uh, asked uh, what uh, their son, like me,、uh, was doing, do you know their response? Do you think they would say something like this? Oh, my son was studying in the seminary to get himself prepared to become a pastor. We are so proud of him. Well, if you think、uh, this was their response,、uh, I would say like、uh, this is kind of a、um, wishful thinking. They said, "I don't know what he's doing. He does what he wants to do," and this is actually was the response. What kind of an answer was this? I felt actually abandoned. It was not until I graduated. Uh, from seminary and was hired by one of the big churches in GTA when they began to change their attitude、uh, towards my choice. And of course, later、um, I became a semi、uh, public figure in the Christian circles, and they're quite happy about it. And that's another story. The reason why I'm telling you all this is because. I want to share with you that decisions between following Jesus and following、uh, the family's desire at times、uh, do come up. You may not be called to become a pastor, but your unchurched or less devoted spouse may discourage you from serving God 
or honoring God uh, with financial means. So now, um, am I saying that faith-related activities always takes uh, precedence over family commitments? Let me bring up another passage uh, in the conclusion. In Mark 7, the author records a dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees. In the conclusion, Jesus says, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of man. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother uh, must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, uh, whatever you would have gained from me is a koban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit them to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. When Jesus says you have a fine way of uh, such and such, his words actually were sarcastic. And he next provides an illustration of rejecting God's commands in favor of human tradition. He quotes from two passages. The, one, uh, the first one is the fifth commandment concerning honoring parents. And the second concerns the penalty of death for disobedience. Jesus then cites an example of Coban, whereby a son could withhold support for his parents by declaring his property to be dedicated uh, to God and thus off limits to them. Coban is a, a Greek term meaning offering or vow. Apparently, uh, the person was using religion, especially created uh, by human tradition, as an excuse for neglecting uh, family responsibilities. In short, the motives of the person uh, making such a vow were probably not pure. The Pharisees made it even worse by refusing him the right to rescind the vow. Even though discipleship to Jesus takes precedence over family desire, one must not use religious activities as an excuse to walk away from family commitments. In the past generations, uh, especially uh, in the um, Chinese community, it was a common practice for devoted Christians to spend hours and nights uh, for church meetings uh, at the expense of spending time with their kids. At times, yes, it was uh, actually more satisfying and sometimes easier to serve outside of the household uh, to get some fresh air. What they probably forgot was that nurturing one's own family was also one of the commitments for becoming a true disciple of Jesus. Well, you may ask me at the end, uh, so Pastor Edward, uh, when is faith first and when is family first? This is a great question. I would say, for those who have been putting family as the priority in the past, you should reflect on whether you are using your family as an excuse for not following Jesus wholeheartedly. On the contrary, for those who have been neglecting your family because you are so busy with church-related activities, you should reflect on whether you are using your faith as an excuse for not practicing God's will for honoring your parents, loving your spouse, or teaching your kids at home. May God give us wisdom to discern the difference between the two and empower us to live out His will with integrity. 
God bless you. Good morning. My name is Alex Wong. I'm one of the deacons at MCPC. Welcome to our morning worship. And now, here are announcements. First, 2021 second quarter general members meeting. And that's today, May 30th at 2.30 p.m. Thank you all for participating and registered. To allow sufficient time for the check-in procedure, please log in to the meeting 15 to 30 minutes before the meeting starts at 2.30. This will allow time for the, the admin to allow you in. Next, church offers reopening. Starting from June 3rd, and that's this Thursday, the church admin office will be reopened during regular operation hours, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. All doors of the church building will stay locked. Brothers and sisters, you can ring the doorbell at the west or north side entrance to access the building and drop off offerings into the offering box. For any other business, please contact the office ahead of time to make arrangement. Next, Genesis community begins in June. Are you back for the summer? Or you never left? Or you want to catch up with your high school and university friends and grow in your faith together? Then you need to join Genesis community starting on Friday, June 4th through soon and possibly as restrictions ease outside the church. We will learn about God career planning, and have fellowship together with familiar faces like Uncle Simon Yun, Eleanor, and Pastor Freddie, as well as special workshops and guests. Please contact Pastor Freddie for further information. For the rest of the announcements, please refer to the bulletin. Thank you all, and have a great Sunday.